Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, this is, uh, you are tuning into Managing Business Needs During a Pandemic. Uh, this uh, presentation is focused on artists and arts organizations. Uh, this voice is Meredith Badler, uh, Program Director at the CBCA, Colorado Business Committee for the Arts. Uh, and today's uh, presentation is done in partnership with the law firm of Snell and Wilmer. Snell and Wilmer has been a longtime member and partner with CBCA, um, a supporter of the arts uh, here in Colorado. And we are just thrilled to work with them uh, to share today's uh, presentation and information. Um, a few housekeeping items before we dive into today's content. Uh, this presentation is being done uh, through Zoom on their webinar platform. So all of you that are attending, uh, you are on mute, your video is turned off, you're here to, um, to listen uh, and participate via the Q&A feature. Uh, so on the bottom of your screen, um, there's the chat feature, which you can, you can also use, but the best way to send questions would be through the Q&A function. So you can type your questions in there um, and we'll either respond to those uh, throughout the presentation or save them for the end, depending on, on the topic. So please know that we are, are keeping an eye on that and we wanna make sure that this content is relevant to you and the work that you're doing. Uh, so please don't be shy, share those questions. Um, a lot of what our speakers will be talking about is constantly, is constantly evolving. Um, Snell and Wilmer uh, did a, a similar presentation, um, I think back in, in March, um, just for sort of general business needs. And um, as we've been working with them to put together this presentation tailored for artists and arts organizations, a number of these of things have changed. So please um, ask you those questions and, and we wanna make this as, as timely and as relevant uh, to you as possible. We are also recording today's webinar. Um, so that recording will be able to share uh, through CBCA's website afterwards. Um, so uh, if there, if you, um, uh, want to share that that link once it gets posted with with others so they can have this information we encourage you in, to do so um, just another disclaimer about questions this is meant to provide general information um, our four attorneys here um, you know always need to walk the line between providing direct specific legal advice to to maybe your unique situation so I, I ask that you please keep your convert your questions applicable to the group um, uh, and we'll do our best to, to handle that. Um, I think those were all of my, my housekeeping items. I'm thrilled to, to introduce our four speakers um, coming from, from Colorado and beyond, actually, uh, from Snell and Wilmer. We have Chung Lee, uh, who actually also serves on the board of directors for CBCA. We have Eric Kintner, uh, Sohaila Shahadi, and Craig O'Laughlin uh, joining us. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and I will mute myself for now, and we'll turn it over to our, our wonderful attorneys from, from Snell and Wilmer uh, to help us through this information. Thank you. Thanks, Meredith. This is Eric Kittner. Thanks so much for uh, letting us join you this morning and chat a little bit about um, some of these these issues. I hope you and your family are doing well during this challenging time. Um, we are going to start today uh, with Chung Lee, uh, who will talk a little bit about um, some of the various um, economic relief and loan programs that are available out there for art, arts organizations, nonprofits. Um, Chung is a partner in our Denver office, and he represents clients in the areas of wealth strategies, corporate law, and cross-border transactions. And uh, Chung has been studying up on all this and is well versed in some of these issues. So I'll turn it over to Chung to chat a little bit today. Thank you very much, uh, Meredith and, and Eric. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I hope that everyone is, uh, you and your family are safe and staying warm uh, on this cold uh, Colorado uh, 
spring slash winter weather today. Um, what I wanted to focus on today was the uh, some of the economic relief programs that are available out there on a federal level as well as uh, uh, on a state and local uh, level. Um, my intention was to um, really uh, pay a lot of attention or spend uh, quite a bit of time on the CARES Act, uh, which is the Coronavirus Aid Recovery and Economic Securities Act uh, that was signed into law by uh, President uh, Trump uh, back in March, um, or actually on, only about two weeks ago. Uh, and uh, as of this morning, and we kind of got the news yesterday um, that uh, the the uh, PPP, which uh, or the Paycheck Protection Program, as many of you have uh, or may already know about, um, has already run out of money, uh, and you know there is uh, discussions uh, within the Treasury Department as well as uh, Congress uh, to um, put uh, or to increase uh, the uh, the appropriations uh, amount. But as of right now. Um, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, as well as the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, um, are uh, has have, have been depleted, and the SBA is not taking any application at this time, just because um, of the problems with the appropriations and 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 the funding um, involved. Um, but there is a chance that uh, that could all change, as uh, as everyone knows. All of this is happening in real time, and you know the information is changing by the hour. Um, so what I want to do is just kind of give a, a, a very thirty foot uh, thousand overview of these two programs, really quick. Um, you know, the when the CARES Act was passed, you know, the whole intention uh, was to provide economic opportunities uh, to small businesses. Um, uh, and in, in, in including uh, nonprofit. So, you know, under the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, uh, small businesses with less than 500 uh, employees uh, or uh, eligible nonprofits uh, and veterans organization and tribal concerns who uh, were eligible to apply for this program. Uh, and again, the whole intention was to make sure that we keep that uh, organizations and company keeps um, uh, people uh, on the payroll. And so, you know, for arts uh, and artists uh, and organizations, um, whether it's set up as a sole proprietor or independent contractor, uh, or if um, the individual is self-employed, uh, they would be uh, eligible to uh, apply for, uh, for funding uh, under the PPP. Um, and so what I would encourage uh, people to do uh, at this point is to you know keep in contact with uh, whoever your banking advisor are your cpa uh, your uh, financial advisor your attorney just to make sure that you're on top of it because you know with within two weeks you know the initial amount was 350 billion dollars and in less than two weeks that whole amount has been depleted so again uh, it's a, on a first come first serve basis so i would encourage uh, that everyone uh, stay connected with your advisor to make sure that you can take advantage of this opportunity and, you know and you know as far as the, the fund from this program um, you can use it for uh, for payroll for rent utilities um, uh, mortgage interest, uh, as well as uh, some of the other costs of running a business, um, and uh, uh, but uh, again, as as I mentioned, that that program is on hold right now because there's uh, the the uh, the loan amount. I mean, the entire appropriation has been depleted. The other program that it was in conjunction with the PPP is the um, Nasser is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, um, and uh, under this program. Um, applicants were eligible to uh, to get up to uh, an advance of up to ten thousand um, dollars within three days uh, of submitting the application and it's been determined that they're eligible and so even if you uh, if the application was denied subsequently uh, that uh, the the advancement up to ten thousand dollars would be forgiven uh, but again um, this particular loan program is on hold uh, right now as well. Um, so focusing, uh, so what, what I want to do is focus uh, on some of the uh, programs here locally uh, in Colorado and in Denver. Um, the, in, in Denver, there is um, the Denver Small Business Emergency Relief Program, uh, which would 
which would actually provide up to $7,500 in cash grants to any business that have been uh, temporarily closed or have, uh, have difficulty paying rent and utilities or have had to lay off um, the, their staff. Uh, the only restriction on this particular program is that the business really has to be in the city and county of, of Denver. Um, and, uh, and, and you can apply directly uh, with, uh, at Denver, denvergov.org uh, to see if you are e eligible. Um, Denver does also have the uh, micro loan program, which provides loans anywhere from $5,000 to $50,000 uh, in order to assist um, uh, businesses uh, that have been uh, affected or are starting up or need any sort of funding at this point. Um, the, the, the one great program right now in Denver uh, is, the, uh, is called Imagine 2020 Artist Assistance Fund. And through this fund, uh, Denver Arts and Venues will award grants up to $1,000 to uh, individual artists who live in Denver whose income has been uh, adversely affected by uh, the current pandemic. Um, and the grant is made available for, use, for uses uh, such as uh, you had to cancel your events, um, or you've incurred travel expenses, or you've lost income um, uh, because the classes were canceled or because of school closures. Um, that's a really great program that is available through Denver uh, uh, as well. Uh, on the state level, um, Governor Polis actually issued an order, uh, an executive or order to encourage banks to suspend uh, foreclosures uh, uh, and other loan payment deferral pro or, or to create uh, other loan payment deferment, deferment programs at this time. I've spoken to, um, to some of the local banks here, our, our national banks that are located here in Denver and um, uh, every single one of them has some form of loan deferment pay, uh, program at this point. You just need to uh, talk with them uh, to see if you can get a, a, a deferral or forbearance uh, on uh, whatever loans that you may have uh, with, the, with the bank. Um, under Colorado, there's also payroll tax credit deferrals. So if, uh, if you've already um, made, uh, made payroll tax payments, you can apply to get a credit uh, uh, for, for, uh, for the full amount or, uh, or, or uh, partial amount. And then uh, if you want to defer the payroll taxes for 2020, um, there, uh, the Colorado does uh, offer that as well, so that you only pay one half of the payroll taxes uh, in December of 2021, and the other half would be in December of 2022. So again, it it, it helps uh, lessen some of the, the the pain right now that a lot of uh, artists and art organizations are going through, as well as uh, as as well as businesses. Um, one of the uh, one of the big resources that I would encourage everyone to go to. Uh, is through the Office of Economic Development and International Trade, or OEDIT. Um, they actually have a list of about 100 different alternative funding sources, and these range anything from uh, uh, deferments, forbearance, to grants, as well as uh, private loans uh, for individuals and, and, and businesses. And um, I had glanced at it before we... Um, before I, uh, we jumped on, on this presentation. And there's quite a few that, uh, that provides grants uh, specifically for arts and culture. So uh, I would encourage people to go visit the OEDIT website and, it's, uh, and uh, they update that uh, throughout the day. So there's constantly uh, new organizations that are coming in to provide grants and uh, loan programs for individual artists uh, as well as art or, or organizations and other types of businesses uh, as well. So wonderful re resources, uh, a wonderful resource, and the amounts could be anywhere from five hundred dollars to you know tens of thousands of dollars. So again, it's it's definitely worth checking out um, uh, during these uh, economic uh, hardship um, for for many individuals. But what I what I also wanted to spend my time on, uh, in addition to uh, telling everyone about the these, some of these economic relief um, is what businesses should do uh, during these during these pandemic or hopefully we don't have to deal with, with it uh, more than once in, in our lifetime. But uh, this is a great opportunity to refocus um, on, on the organization 
uh, or on your uh, cash flow. So uh, there's really two things I want to to look at um, or uh, discuss with regards to you know what what can be put in place uh, to provide some securities to minimize the impact uh, at this time. Let's assume that you weren't able to get any of these loans or forbearance or any of these grants. What can you do? Um, what I would encourage people to do uh, from internally is to look at the internal management structure. You know, are there efficiencies uh, in place where you can cut costs? Um, I, I, I know that it's not something that uh, a lot of people want to do because it's such a hard and, and, and difficult decision when you're having to look at uh, uh, internally and say, hey, what can we do at these times? Um, but, you know, can we make the organization more efficient? And when I say more efficient, that may, uh, that may mean that you have to uh, furlough certain people or, um, you know, combine roles, again, in order to create efficiencies and in order to try to preserve as much cash flow as possible. Um, and uh, from a financial per financial uh, stability perspective, um, I, I've mentioned you know looking at the cash flow and liquid liquidity issues. I would say you no, know, don't wait until it's too late. I would say start looking right now. You know, can you trim uh, the fat uh, anywhere with, within the company, and where can you preserve uh, some of the cash? Can you do something with your expenses uh, at this time in order to um, you know stay afloat uh and uh along with that you know i i know that a lot of organizations and a lot of people have had to cancel events have had to uh, um stop doing any sort of fundraising and and things but what i i would encourage uh organizations and, and individuals to do is look at can you do this can you, are there other alternative ways for you to try to create some sort of income at, at this time while trying to cut a, expenses. Um, uh, also look at modifying operational issues to deal with the current in environment. Uh, and I would use this opportunity as you're going through this and, and saying, hey, uh, where can we create efficiencies um, to incorporate that uh, in the long-term goals? I, I know that a lot of organizations have created, you know, three-year goals, five-year goals. I think right now, you know, all that, unfortunately, is out the window. So you really need to uh, look back and say, hey, look, for the, next, for the next three months, what do we need to do? And can we, uh, and, you know, where, where can we tighten our belt a little bit? And by doing so, can we incorporate that into our long-term goal once we get to the other side and once we get out of this pandemic? Um, so how do we cut some of these, these expenses? I, I, I would encourage you to look at the, your current uh, liabilities and, and talk to whoever it is that uh, is the um, lender uh, uh, or whoever that you're owing money to. Uh, I would say reach out, you know, open up that line of communication and one, either uh, have a conversation with them about uh, doing a forbearance or a deferment uh, or two, can that particular debt obligation be modified in some way um, and, and in, in talking with banks and talking with uh, private lenders, um, they are, uh, all of them seem to be very understanding and they are definitely open up to, uh, to communication. So I would encourage uh, for you know, any organization to, or, or individuals, uh, if, if you're self-employed, to be looking at, at any way to uh, try to alleviate some of the um, financial pressures that you may have right now. Uh, and then one last thing is the banks are still open for, for business. So I would look at, you know, are there, uh, what assets do you have right now? And if you need, um, you know, whether it's a bridge loan or anything else to get you to the, to, to the other side is to look at your available, uh, available assets, available resources, have that conversation with, with, with the bank and, and see if they would be able to somehow provide you with uh, additional credit uh, so, so that, you know, you can stay afloat until you, everyone gets back on, uh, on their feet. Um, so those are the, the, the typical things that I would uh, encourage that everyone look, uh, look at right now while we're going through these, uh, these uh, difficult and historical times. Um, but, and one last thing is, please, you know, I, I, I would encourage everyone to, um, uh, 
you know, stay in touch with your professional advisors because uh, I know that a lot of them have a lot of resources that they can provide and uh, continue working with them. I, I, I know that it's extremely difficult, but right now it's the really uh, the time uh, to have these difficult conversations and to look at these uh, uh, issues uh, seriously. Um, you know, we, we've, we've had a, 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 some stellar past few years uh, ab- after the last crisis in 2008, but right now is a great, a great opportunity to revisit uh, uh, all, all of the internal um, structuring uh, that, uh, that, that you may have. So um, with that, I will turn it back to uh, Eric. So thank you very much uh, for uh, everyone joining us uh, this morning. Great. Thank you, Chung. That's some, some really good information, hopefully, that is useful and helpful for our attendees. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce partner Craig O'Laughlin. Uh, Craig practices in all areas of employment law, uh, and he's going to discuss some of the employer-related provisions under some of the recent bills that were passed in response to the pandemic and how those may be an impact on your organization. Craig? Great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I am going to have uh, Rachel just quickly unshare her screen and if everybody will bear with me, I am going to share uh, my screen and hopefully everybody can, that's, that's on this by video can see the flow chart that I've got up. For those of you who are potentially not uh, seeing this video wise, I'll, I'll certainly describe it hopefully well enough that it will matter. So one thing that uh, this is a, a flow chart that basically I put together sort of out of out of my head to uh, deal with the Family First uh, Coronavirus Response Act. That's the act that either gives your employees paid sick leave or uh, paid family leave uh, in order to you know, handle one of six very specific issues. Uh, and, and that FSCRA, like many federal laws, was, was written in a way that's kind of hard to understand if you're looking just at the text of the act. And I'm a visual learner, so I wanted to quickly, for those of you who can see this, kind of take you through what I did here and, and, and what, how it works for, for nonprofits. Now, the first thing I should say is the FSCRA absolutely applies to nonprofits just like it applies to uh, private employers and for-profit businesses. The biggest thing that, that nonprofit businesses should keep their eye out for is an exemption for less than 50 employees. Now, uh, it, for those of you who can see my mouse, I'm going to circle where that exemption is. And it's, it's kind of down here lower in the chart. So uh, the reason I point that out is because it's important for, for nonprofits to remember every piece of this law applies to them. They just have a tiny, tiny exemption under only one of the reasons that someone might go out on leave. And that exemption isn't absolute. It is still quite narrow, uh, even in and of itself. So what I did is kind of on the flow chart, I set out the six reasons across the middle that somebody could go out on paid sick leave or, or out on paid family leave. And uh, before, you, before you ever get to those six reasons, there's a number of questions you have to ask yourself. Am I less than 500 employees? Yep. Am I a healthcare um, um, provider or an emergency responder? Nope. Okay, keep going. Are my workers already on furlough or is the work site closed? If the answer is yes, I want everybody to remember that FSCRA benefits are not for any employee who you've got on furlough or who you don't have an active employment status because that is what unemployment benefits are for. And I'm gonna to get to that in just a second. But FSCRA benefits are only for people that, are, that you've actively got working for you. And here's the last gotcha. It has to be true, positively true, that they cannot work from home. So uh, active employment, but cannot work from home. And then the FFCRA set out basically six reasons for how a person could either get two weeks of paid sick leave or up to 12 weeks of paid family leave. And uh, reasons one, two, and three you know, number one being that they're subject to a quarantine order. You know, earlier we thought this had to be a very specific order, but, but now we are aware through the questions and answers provided to us by the Department of Labor that this would apply to generally any state stay-at-home orders. Um, if you're subject to a, a, an order to stay home, that qualifies you. Now, why wouldn't that apply to everybody? Well, because essential businesses, uh, even though they, they are subject to the order, they've actually been told in these orders you go to work. You have a special responsibility to work. 
Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to parse which nonprofits would or wouldn't qualify as essential businesses. I think that for the most part, many of them would not. Uh, but there's certainly good good examples of, of nonprofit businesses that would qualify as an essential business under those particular state orders. And so in a situation where a nonprofit doesn't qualify as an essential business, um, then it's pretty easy that um, that, that, that workers would, would, would fit under number one. But when they do qualify as an essential business, even still that nonprofit should be looking very closely at a particular employee to determine if they're actually an essential employee in an essential business. And if they're not, that might be why they, uh, an employee would fit under number one. Number two and number three are interesting. Number, number two is really just that the employee has been told by a healthcare provider to stay home. And that's actually pretty straightforward. Um, they, they, for whatever reason, and they may not even have symptoms, but the healthcare provider may have just decided that they're at high enough risk. Um, and then number three is for somebody who does have symptoms uh, and, and who is seeking medical diagnosis and it's taking some time uh, for them to, to, to get to the end of the tunnel there in which they understand what, what, the, what the prescription is. So for all three of those reasons, it's 80 hours of pay and it's up for a two-week period and it's up to but not exceeding $511 per day. Now, uh, employers very early on were very bothered by this because they said, we can't pay for this. We don't, we don't have money for this, but I want everybody to conceptually think about this as you're not paying for it. Uncle Sam is paying for it. Uh, Uncle Sam is going to pay for it with a pot of money that Uncle Sam actually has in your bank account. Every one of us as, as employers, we withhold uh, federal taxes, both the employee's part and our part. Social Security and, and, and uh, Medicare, we hold these monies aside and we rip them, remit them to the federal government uh, and we report them on a quarterly basis. Under this act, the federal government says, use that. That's our money in your bank account. So don't remit it to us. Hang on to it and use that to pay these amounts. And then when you file your quarterly reports with us on a, on a form that we now have, the IRS is now speaking, uh, given to you, you can not send that money to us, but take credit for having sent it to us. In other words, we've got a stack of money. It's in the employer's bank account. We want you to use that to pay for this. And if it doesn't cover that, if it doesn't cover the amount that you might have to pay uh, under the FFCRA, you can file a form with us to get a very quick, hopefully less than two weeks uh, refund uh, on, on, on the difference. There's a lot to be said about that, but I'm gonna keep moving because we have very limited time. Um, Reason number four is, is uh, simply that the employee is caring for somebody who falls under one, two, and three. Uh, and, and I'm going to skip five for a second, and I'm going to jump to reason number six, which is uh, that, the, that the Department of Health and Human Services comes up with a reason in the future. Six doesn't exist yet, but it, uh, so that the HHS doesn't have to get a rewrite of the law. If anything should happen during this pandemic that creates an additional reason that should cause for paid leave, uh, they're reserving six there. Numbers four and number six are also for 80 hours of pay, but they are only for, uh, it, it's capped at a two thirds of the salary and in no event to go uh, higher than, than $200 per day. And I should have said two thirds of the hourly rate, or two thirds of, the, of, their, of their wage. So what the flow chart does for you is it kind of, it kind of guides you to the green boxes, which is, are the results. One, two, and three get a certain result. Four and six get a certain result. And five is the odd one. Five is the one that isn't for two weeks. Five is the one that is for up to 12 weeks, and that's when the employee is caring for a child whose uh, school or daycare uh, is, is closed due to COVID-19 reasons. Now, this is, uh, uh, you've been very patient with me, so thank you for letting me get you to the point where here's where nonprofits really get impacted to the degree that they have less than 50 employees. Uh, any employer with less than 50 employees can say that right there, that number five, that keeping the employee out uh, for 12 weeks of paid time is, is too high a burden on us. That's one that we cannot bear, and that's one that we're going to uh, self-claim an exemption. And I want everyone to be careful with that, is that this exemption is self-determined, meaning if you get it wrong, it's all on you. And the Department of Labor has said, don't send us any paperwork. Uh, that's, not, that's not anything we want to see. We're going to just give you three criteria, criteria to live with. If, if this would cause, if putting a person out under number five would cause you to be unable to operate at a minimum capacity or 
if putting a person out under number five and paying for their, their 12 weeks of leave would put substantial risk to the financial health of, of your business, or, or if there's just not sufficient workers to perform the function of the employee that's gone out on leave. And I want to caution everyone that if you want to go down this road where you say we're exempt from that because one of those three things is true, I want to caution everybody to do it on an employee by employee basis. If you've got 32 employees, it may be that that analysis gets you exempt because of a certain employee, but it, it's not necessarily true that that would be true automatically then for all of your employees. Certain employees have different roles, obviously different financial impacts on the, uh, on the, uh, on the business. So um, then we have one more criteria to check before we, we advance further on number five, and that is, has the employee been with us for at least 30 days? Assuming most, most employees have, what you end up with for number five is kind of a hybrid approach, but generally speaking, uh, you, you get the two green boxes down here below my flowchart for anybody who can't see it, you get 12 weeks, two thirds of the salary, up to $300 per day. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot here really quick with just the, the uh, couple of minutes that I have left, um, and I'm gonna have to do a new share one moment. So that was the FFCRA, and generally speaking, that the, the biggest issue for nonprofits there is the 50 employee threshold. Now I'm going to completely move from one federal law to a different federal law, and it's the CARES Act. The CARES Act obviously is voluminous, it's got many, many pages to it, um, and, and one of the pieces of it are sections 2104, 2107, and 2102. Now, to the degree anybody was like, oh, what do I care about the numbers? It actually might be helpful if you write down those three numbers, 2104, 2107, and 2102. And I want it in that order for a particular reason. Uh, under the CARES Act, section 2104 says that, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase here, so please allow me some latitude. Under 2104, the government is going to give $600 of unemployment compensation per week to anybody who qualifies under a particular state, state scheme. Now, on my share here, you can see that the state of Colorado offers up to $618 per week for 26 weeks. That's the state of Colorado's gift. I've got other states obviously there. Some of you might know Arizona, where I'm sitting. $240 a week is the lowest in the entire country. Anyway, I digress. Let's get back to Colorado. So if your employees who you decide to furlough uh, or who you decide to lay off, it doesn't matter. Uh, probably each state has a different definition of unemployment, but generally speaking, if you, if you fully furlough or fully lay off your employee, they're going to be able to collect uh, usually, and I, I never promise this to employees, I just use it as a guide. So under 2104, first the state qualifies them for, for, if we're in Colorado, up to 618 per week, and then the state would add the federal government's $600 per week. Now, what is 2107 for? Well, 2104 says the 600 from the federal government matches that 618 for up to 26 weeks. But the federal government created 2107 of the CARES Act saying, and if situation is really dire for this person, we'll add an additional 13 weeks of that $600. So for 26 weeks, this Colorado employee would get $1,218, theoretically, and for another 13 weeks, they get the $600. Now, you, you all heard me say 2102, and I'm gonna quickly describe what's going on there. 2102 is, is, is the section that says, look, we understand that, that, that employment, unemployment benefits are really reserved to uh, employees. But in this particular case, self-employed individuals, gig workers, that kind of person, we're going to create a whole new section that's gonna allow them to get the $600 per week for up to 39 weeks. Uh, or if for whatever reason, somebody is an employee and, and, and got disqualified under 2104 or 2107, 2102 will step in and help them as well. And so for those employees that normally don't qualify for, uh, for up to 39 weeks, the federal government's $600 a week comes in. Some really important points here. Employers are used to seeing their account rating get charged by state agency, state unemployment agencies. In other words, for Colorado, that 618 that pays out a week, it hits your employer rating and it causes your premiums in some cases to go up. But the $600 coming from the federal government, it's not, it's not yours and it doesn't hurt you and it doesn't hit you. 
And the reason I point this out is because there's a lot of misconceptions about how unemployment uh, benefits work. But the biggest thing to, to realize here is that $1,218 per week, uh, you know, divided, divide that out by 40, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty big amount of money. And it is absolutely true if you've heard it that some employees, especially hourly employees making, I don't know, $20 an hour or less, really in, in, in Colorado, probably 25 or less, they're going to do better on an unemployment scheme for 26 weeks at least. And so that doesn't mean that, you know, you're not necessarily trying to incent the workers that you need, uh, but to the degree that you're looking at a furlough or a layoff, there is some peace of mind there, at least for those, for that, that period. Uh, that, that, that that employees should be uh, financially okay. That I've got a, a lot of information in there, and that could be two whole seminars. Just like every one of our presenters today could 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 have taken more time. I'll put a um, a pause there, uh, and if we need to, back at the end to revisit anything we can. So with that, Eric, back to you. Great, thank you, Craig. I know it's a lot of information, but uh, you know this will be recorded for everyone. There's folks that can't attend, so if things get a, a little bit uh, confusing and there's a lot of references, we can certainly take some questions offline as needed. So thank you uh, so much. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce you to uh, my colleague, Sohalia Shahidi. Sohalia uh, focuses her practice in tax, where she often works with nonprofit and tax exempt or organizations and this morning she'll talk about the various tax provisions under the CARES Act that may be applicable to nonprofit organizations. Thank you Eric. Um, so the first topic I wanted to cover was um, delay in payment of employer payroll taxes. The CARES Act allows employers to delay paying the employer portion of social security taxes for the period from March 27 of 2020 to January 1st of 2021. Half of the deferred amount will be due at the end of 2021 and the other half will be due at the end of 2022. Um, this is available to employers regardless of the number of employees they have. And as long as employers pay their portion of social security tax by the due date that I mentioned earlier, which would be half of the payment at the end of 2021 and the other half at the end of 2022, then no penalties will be imposed. Um, something to keep in mind is that the deferral is not available to any employer that has received a loan under the Paycheck Protection Program and has had indebtedness forgiven with respect to that loan. And uh, also, if employers uh, use a third party to pay their wages, then uh, and the employer decides to defer the payment of Social Security tax under this provision, then the employer will be solely responsible for paying the employer side of social security taxes by the due date. So that was um, one of the programs and one of the benefits of the CARES Act that I wanted to mention. The next one is um, employee retention credit under the CARES Act. This credit provides a benefit of up to $5,000 per employee. The credit is calculated based on 50% uh, of up to $10,000 of qualified wages paid after March 12th of 2020 through the end of 2020. So who are the employers that can qualify? Um, one of two requires must be met for an employer to be able to take advantage of this uh, benefit under the act. The first one is that the operation of the employer's trade or business must be fully or partially suspended due to orders from a governmental authority in relation to COVID. Or uh, the second way that an employer can qualify is that there must be a significant decline in gross receipts. This decline occurs at, in the calendar quarter in which the gross receipts are less than 50% of gross receipts from the same calendar quarter in the prior year and ends with the calendar quarter in which gross receipts are greater than 80% of the gross receipts for the same calendar quarter in the prior year. So for example, if in quarter two of 2020, the gross receipts fall below 50% of quarter two in 2019, then there has been a significant decline in gross receipts. Let's say in quarter three, the gross receipts are greater than 80% of quarter three in 2019. At the end of quarter three in 2020, this period ends. That means that the employer is eligible in quarter two and quarter three of 2020. And also this applies to tax exam organizations. So they can also take advantage of this. So let's say an employer qualifies 
because it meets one of these two requirements and can get a tax credit of 50% of qualified wages of up to $5,000 of credit. So what are qualified wages? If the employer had an average of more than 100 full-time employees in 2019, then the qualified wages are, paid, uh, are wages paid to employees for not working due to one of those two reasons. Either the operations are suspended or there is a significant reduction in gross receipts. So this, is, uh, this would be wages paid to employees that are not working due to one of those two reasons. But if the employer had an average of 100 or fewer full-time employees in 2019, then qualified wages are any wages paid to the employee. In other words, the employer can obtain the credit while paying its employees to work. So how do the employers get the credit? The employers can hold back FICA and employee income tax withholding in anticipation of the credit. Also, if the credit is more than the amount of FICA and employee income tax withholding, the employer can request an advance from the government. Um, However, employers should be careful not to overcalculate the amount of credit because if there is an underpayment due to a miscalculation, then there uh, could be penalties. And um, there are also limits on the amount of the credit uh, or, or the eligibility for the credit. If the employer is receiving any other credit on the, on the same wages or if there are loans that the employer is receiving under the CARES Act, you want to be cautious because the credit may not apply. Overall, the intent is that one benefit should apply in relation to wages and not more than one. That being said, it might be possible to stack credits on different but successive wages. There are also other limitations. For example, the amount paid to workers can be limited to amounts paid in prior 30 days under certain circumstances. And also, multiple entities may have to be combined in calculating the number of full-time employees. So that's the employee retention credit program. And the last topic I wanted to cover uh, is the charitable contribution modifications that were made in the CARES Act. Um, individuals that do not elect to itemize may uh, receive a $300 above the line charitable deduction in addition to the standard deduction for tax years beginning in 2020 for qualified charitable contributions they make. So what are qualified charitable contributions? There are cash contributions that, among other requirements, are made to public charities that are not supporting organizations and a certain private foundations. And also, the contributions um, are not for establishment of a new or maintenance of an existing donor advised fund. Also, for 2020, the Act increases the AGI limit and the taxable income limit for cash contribution deductions for individuals and corporations. For individuals, the limit has been increased from 60% of AGI to 100% of AGI. And, and for the corporations, the limit has been increased from 10% to 25% of taxable income. And any excess over that amount would be carried over for up to five succeeding taxable years. That's all I have, Eric. Great, thank you, Sahelia. Um, I, uh, this is Eric Kittner again, who a partner in our at Denver office, and I work routinely with nonprofit organizations on various corporate and board matters. So I, I thought I would start the day with just some high level thoughts on board corporate governance. If there are board members on the phone or uh, executive directors, um, things that sort of should be chatting with your board. Um, given what is going on today, it's important for boards to continue to do its oversight functions over management in the organization. And then I'll touch on a little bit of just uh, some of the provisions we see in some uh, nonprofit agreements from time to time, like event agreements or your gala agreements or even some performance obligations under leases. Clauses in those agreements that we refer to as force majeure may be triggered in the event um, because of some of the government restrictions. So I'll talk a little bit about some of those issues. But first, on board governance. Um, you know, the pandemic presents some pretty complex issues for nonprofits and their boards to navigate. You know, this is kind of a high level overview of some just ideas that I have and thinking through the, the topics today. So obviously everyone is gonna be a little different based on your organization, but it's important for boards to continue to fulfill that oversight role. And ultimately it's, you know, the management, the day-to-day -day responsibility. Um, you know, your your folks that are working um, at the employment, the uh, the employees and the staff, 
that are overseeing the day to day. But the, the board's role should really still be one of oversight, which requires, you know, the monitoring of your management activity and assessing whether the management is taking appropriate action, maybe providing additional guidance and direction and obviously staying well informed of any developments within the organization, as well as the larger uh, community situation we're all living through. So here are just a few high level thoughts I had on board governance as we sort of have think about how to apply these standard principles to the current situation. So I think number one, I think is certainly health and safety, right? So we need to make sure that with management help, we're setting a tone at the top through communications and policies designed to protect employee well-being and to act responsibly to slow the spread of COVID-19. So we should be monitoring from a board level management's efforts to do that, to make sure that we, the management is putting in place proper um, policies and procedures to protect the health and safety of employees and their families, customers, stakeholders, business partners, public at large. Um, and so it's really important that we continue that function of oversight and, and focusing on health and safety, which I think is, is really number one at this time. Um, the second one I would highlight, highlight is just sort of operational risk oversight. Um, as members of board of directors myself, I've had several board meetings already thinking through what are the significant risks to the nonprofit organization with the fact that we are going through this pandemic. How is the budget changing? What are the supporters of our organization doing? What are grant organizations? Do we have events coming up that need to be canceled? It is really important that the boards and the management of the organization are working together closely during this time to, to, to get those regular updates from management onto uh, the, the financial situation and how things are looking from a risk standpoint. Um, you know, if you haven't scheduled recent board meetings, I highly recommend you do so. It may be a time to get off the sort of monthly schedule and do something more more frequent to sort of manage the risk during this time. Um, and certainly having documentation of the board's consideration decisions about these related matters is really important um, to sort of make sure that we're keeping a good record of that oversight function. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I, another one that we've talked about on other of these calls as part of that oversight and risk management is the cybersecurity risk. Um, this is the time where all of us are working from home. Uh, a lot of us are anyway. And I think that we've seen already that the cyber criminals out there are not letting up and they're actually doubling up on their efforts. So it's really important that we continue to continue to provide oversight and training to staff on appropriate work from home policies, making sure our IT systems are set up in a way to detect potential incursions and any risk there. And so continuing the efforts around cybersecurity, I think, is really important. Business continuity is another issue that we see a lot in corporate governance issues. Um, basically, the idea that the, the business, the nonprofit has in place um, appropriate plans and policies to address risks or disruptions that might be identified. Um, this could be things like employee talent disruption. So you've got employees who have now shifted working remotely and are just unable due to work environments to, to um, continue to go into the office. So we need to be able to continue to staff appropriately as necessary and to monitor the ability of our work technology, remote work functions to meet, to meet those employee disruptions. Uh, there's obviously going to be a, a large financial impact and liquidity issues, which Chung mentioned about a little bit earlier, but it's really important for the board to have those policies in place to address um, what are the potential near term, what are the midterm issues. You know, we need to really go back and revisit budgets that are projected on certain revenue coming in the organization over the year uh, and go back and revisit those and understand how projected decrease in revenue causes a corresponding decrease in expenses. What are some of the key person risks? So for example, what happens if, if an important key person in the, in the organization, a CEO, executive director, were to become infected with COVID-19? Do we have somebody in place, stand on standby, that's up to speed that can step in and take over in an emergency situation like that? So those are another considerations and plans that board and management should be working through. Um, and then just, you know, in terms of just general cadence with the board, I do think that having more regularly scheduled meetings and updates, it doesn't maybe have to be a full board meeting, but, but simply having management continue to push out information to the board 
in terms of communications that are going to employees and staff. I feel like at the organizations I've been a part of, having that back and forth can really inform management and bring in that board expertise that may not need to be at a four board level, but having that, that routine and regular communication um, touch base with, with your management team, I think is really important during this time. Uh, crisis management is the other one I would just focus on. Um, what what would what is the organization prepared if somebody within the organization tests positive? Um, how are we going to notify staff who have been expected, who have been in, potentially infected as well through that contact? Um, what privacy implications are are required then in order to, to properly inform folks without with while still doing the legal obligations to protect employee privacy? There are a host of issues. Um, as the, our organizations are dealing with this now and as the reopening starts, that you're going to want to have these scenarios thought out and plans of action for how to respond to them when and, in, in, when and if this happens. Um, finally, I think uh, what I would just mention as I touch on a little bit is just really, um, I think having boards involved with communications is critical. Um, some management staff are sort of proceeding with sort of running with that. And I think that may be appropriate in your organization, but I think there's a lot of benefit for, for the management team to continue to, to con uh, have conversations with the board in terms of what should the communications be to the public? What should our communications be to our staff, our personnel, our customers? Um, I think the board provides a broader, uh, may have a broader sense of what's going on in the community and opportunities there. And the management should not at all feel reluctant to reach out for them for those that help in managing really this crisis um, for the organization. So uh, with the few minutes we have left, I'll touch a little bit about some of the contracts that some organizations might have and how they've been impacted by, you know, the, the gathering restrictions, the stay at home orders. Um, we've been doing this a lot with a lot of uh, clients and sort of working through with them. What are their potential remedies? So often commercial agreements leasing agreements, vendor agreements, event agreements will have clauses in them that we call force majeure or possibility clauses that might excuse a party's non-performance when an extraordinary event outside that party's control prevents a party from fulfilling their obligations. The applicability of these provisions is very contract specific. Um, so it's going to depend on the words actually on the page, but, and it's, you know, it's usually a pretty high bar. It's not uh, something that can be easily triggered, but obviously these are, are very unusual times with all the restrictions on travel, movement, and gathering, shelter in place, schools are closed, dining and service, restaurants are closed. So it is likely that these events have potentially triggered force majeure under your contract. So a few things to kind of think through um, as if you're considering these options under the contracts. For the government stay-at-home restrictions, it's going to become pretty specific on state and local. Um, a lot of these restrictions are in place in Colorado until close to the end of the month, uh, the end of April. Um, there are some that are now being extended. You see other places, in, for example, in New York that have extended theirs through the middle of May. We might see that in Colorado. We might be at a leveling off here in a plateau, and we might see the restrictions stay uh, to, to actually expire at the end of the month. So it's important to keep, keep looking at that and determine what, what those stay-at-home orders are and whether that stay-at-home has directly caused um, a restriction on your event or performance under the agreement. Government gathering restrictions is another one to really look at this. Now, so a lot of those were put in place before the stay at home. So if you remember, the ramp up sort of started with no gatherings of more than 1,000 people, and then 500, and then 250, and then 10, and then a stay at home order happened. And as the stay at home orders come off, we anticipate that these gathering restrictions are likely going to stay in place. So large events, even if the stay at home order is, is lifted, will, may still very well be restricted. So it may be a situation that now, even if your event is happening in June, July, August, September, that it may be now if the contract has become impossible because of situations going on with the gathering restrictions. Again, it's going to be pretty fact specific, but it's something to keep in mind that the stay at home orders being lifted does not necessarily mean the contract can still be performed. So if you have a force majeure clause in your contract and if you do believe it's been triggered, it's still important to try to prevent and what we say mitigate your damages. So look for alternatives. Are there other ideas out there that we could still try to work with the, the current agreement to, to see if this would work? 
it's important to pay attention to your notice provisions. Often these clauses say, you need to, if there's an force majeure event, you need to notify the other party within 10 days of this happening. So if you're triggered on a stay at home order, you'd have to go to the day the order was announced um, and, then, and then provide the notice. And this is where maybe a gathering restriction may give you a little bit more flexibility. So it's important to stay in t attention close to those and, and looking at those contracts. If your contract does not have a quote force majeure clause or an impossibility clause, there are still doctrines under what we call the common law that might be available to um, to provide what we call an affirmative defense to performance. So there is a doctrine of impossibility in Colorado, which is actually a little bit broader and it does sort of rise to a level of impracticability. Um, and you need to sort of go through an, an analysis there where the event that has happened makes it impossible or illegal or commercially impracticable. There's different sort of rules there, um, depending on what governing law might apply to the contract um, to, to determine whether the, this event has really become um, impracticable. And, and, the, and the Colorado standard is basically one that says it's, it must be an extreme and unreasonable difficulty, expense or injury or loss involved. So simply losing money on the event doesn't necessarily trigger that level. It needs to really be almost impossible to have. There's another doctrine we call frustration of purpose, which might apply in the event that technically the event can still happen. It's not impossible to still hold the event, but ultimately the purpose of the event was been frustrated. So we call the frustration of purpose doctrine. Similar sort of analysis here, it's pretty high bar, but it may be something that, that may help with some of these contracts that you're looking at. So a few, a few next steps then, and then we'll pause and see if there's any questions. Um, if you haven't already done so, and you've got events or you've got contracts that are coming up or that you're looking at whether you can still perform under them, it's important that you review these contracts um, and make sure you've got any of these agreements that what the clauses say to understand what the potential remedies are or whether you may also be subject to a, a vendor or another party that may sort of claim that, that this clause prevents them from performing for you. Um, if a clause is triggered, remember notice provisions may be in there to follow those. As I mentioned, we, we've, we'd certainly recommend in this time where everyone is suffering to start open lines of communication. I think Chung mentioned this earlier with talking to your creditors and partners. Having the conversations early we think are very important to try to see what can be done to work out um, scenarios where there's really win-win opportunities there. Uh, it does go a long way, I think, to establishing goodwill between the parties. Uh, it does allow for negotiation, potential waivers of fees, rescheduling of events, other items that might be palatable to both parties rather than sort of having to go through a, a termination issue. And then the final item is just continue to remain vigilant. These, these laws, these gathering restrictions, and now the reopening guidelines that are announced. We had some CDC sort of outline that were announced last night in draft form. We've had Governor Polis make some announcements last night. We've had various governors issue some pronouncements over the last 24 hours on what they're gonna be looking at for reopening. So it's, it's important that you stay vigilant with those, continue to monitor them, um, follow the press, Go to our website. We've got legal alerts we're publishing on a daily basis um, that will keep folks informed on what these, um, how these um, stay-at-home orders are being modified and new restrictions and guidelines that are being published. And with that, I will take a moment. We're a couple minutes until the time, but maybe we've got some questions or... Hey, Eric, this is, this is Meredith. And if, if we have to go over, we won't get, get kicked off. We do have two questions that, that came through, and I think they're probably both for Craig. Um, I don't know if he can see sort of the Q&A function, but I can summarize them, them both. The first... I see them, yeah. Oh, good. I, I, I can see them. I'll, I'll take them uh, both here quickly. The first Super. question is, are there any employers that the 500 employee limit does not apply to for paid leave, self-care, at PFML? Uh, no. And, and one, one thing that, that's con that gets confusing about that is if you take the SF SFCRA on one side and the CARES Act on the other side, they both use this 500 employees number. But the reason it gets confusing is that the FSCRA has no budge. It's, it's 500. So if you have less than 500, this law applies. There's some guidance on how to count that, but there, there's no exceptions to that. And, and the reason that might, you might have heard differently is because small business loans uh, under the PPP have a, I'm going to use a funny word here, have a little bit of squishiness on that 500 employees, depending on some SBA definitions. 
So no, there, there's there's no leeway if you have um, if you have if you're over that mark under the FFCRA, the FFCRA does not apply to you. In other words, the government is not okay with you using their money. You're too big of an employer. Um, and then the next question is, if our two workers are just independent contractors, how can we best handle those workers? in an empathetic and ethical way with the side note that we're debating on whether to temporarily let one of our workers go, rehire them once we can uh, due to the lack of work. Um, and then the other worker, we would be able to continue working for maybe another month or two. Okay, I'm gonna try my best to cover a very complex question in about a minute. Here's the issue. Independent contractors and employees, of course, are very different things. We do not pay into any unemployment schemes for independent contractors that we 1099. That means, theoretically, there are no unemployment benefits for them. Now, usually an independent contractor understands that, and when any employment or any engagement ends, I don't want to use the word employment, um, they don't go to an unemployment office to collect benefits, and then, therefore, the unemployment division of a state never looks further into whether you have them collect, correctly classified as an independent contractor. I should note that sometimes independent contractors do try to go and apply for unemployment, even though they technically are not allowed, only to be told by the unemployment agency, we think you are incorrectly classified as an independent contractor, we think you are an employee, we will give you benefits, and we will charge the account of the employer that incorrectly classified you and we may take tell other agencies. That's a mouthful, I'm sorry to, to be doom and gloom, but it sets up the point I'm gonna make, which is a really weird situation that we're in. If you let go of independent contractors at this time, and I'm gonna refer back to what I said earlier, 2104, 2107, 2102. 2104 and 07 apply to employees. 2102 applies to independent contractors. So we have this very, very crazy paradox in this situation because for the first time ever, a, a fired independent contractor could go down to the unemployment office of the state and get that $600 a week under 2102. That's a good thing. And normally it would be a, a good for an employer to tell uh, an independent contractor, hey, we're gonna cut our contract with you, but you might have benefits under 2102 down at the state unemployment office, even though you're an independent contractor. And as great as that sounds, I wanna prepare every employer for the possibility that when the independent contractor gets down to the unemployment office and says, I'm here to collect benefits, and they very astutely say, under 2102, it is quite possible that the, that the unemployment commission of that state will say to the person, we got some questions for you, and will decide that that person has been incorrectly classified as an independent contractor, and will therefore put them right up under 2104 and 2107, which works out great for them, because in Colorado, they'd get an extra $618 a week from the state, and not just the $600, but it works out terribly for the employer who now probably gets told that they're going to be audited, potentially investigated for the use of independent contractors when they should have been classified as employees. Now, that question it has so much to it, and I can't go further without another couple of hours as to what that analysis is. So my answer to that question is, you can keep those independent contractors uh, under a, an agreement to continue paying them. You're probably in the best position because sending them down to collect the 2102 CARES Act benefit could result in a real sting for you if the, if the unemployment division reclassifies them as employees and puts them under 2104 and 07 and starts asking for your payroll and starts looking into your company to determine whether you did that correctly. And I'll take a breath now. Sorry, that was more than a minute. <laughs> uh, Craig, this is Eric. I, I'll, I'll just jump in there. Slightly different issue, but similar. You know, the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment has been working to uh, allow unemployment filings for what they call sole proprietors, and they hope to roll that out by Monday. So you might have, uh, there's probably a, dis a difference between what Craig's talking about, an independent contractor and a sole proprietor, but if you might have folks that do fall within sole proprietors that may be able to get unemployment from Colorado. Thank you all for that. That was so much wonderful information. I cannot believe we, we packed that into to just about an hour. Um, so thank you all. I know we're all sitting at home, but we'll all just, I'll, I'll applaud into my mic microphone so it can get recorded just how appreciative uh, we are of, of your time and for this partnership with, with Snell and Wilmer. You guys are putting out some great 
um, resources through through your website and we hope people will continue to go there. Again, we recorded today's presentation, so hopefully this can be a resource for the future. I know I will be looking back at, at Craig's colorful flowchart diagram uh, in the recording. Those were just such wonderful resources. Um, CBCA uh, is continuing to, to be a resource as the intersection of arts and business um, now and into the future um, with various ways that we can help artists, cultural organizations, creative businesses uh, survive this, this current economic situation and thrive into the future. Um, so please uh, use us as a resource. Our Advancing Creatives program has a number of educational webinars and tools. Colorado Attorneys for the Arts, or CAFTA, uh, continues its legal referral service to connect artists to pro bono legal help um, to dive even deeper in some of these topics. Um, so we are, we are here for you, um, and we're so delighted that our, our partners at Snell and Wilmer are as well. So thank you all for, for participating. Um, and sharing information, and we hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.